That was uh, the quest for technocracy by the Iron Age archive in-house um, anime e-girl band. The uh, the archivettes. Jeffrey, you there? Right, I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like uh, Renegade wasn't able to guess the song this week. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, mega points of Renegade. <laughs> you got me no clue what this song is from. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's it, so. Anyway, I had a little bit of a sabbatical. I was a little bit burned out from RL, um, and now we're uh, back. Um, so. Krishi hyped for some serious stuff. Well, I hope I don't let you down. Um, so, yeah, how are you, Jeff? I'm doing well. Yeah. So, yeah, this past week was the 75th anniversary of NATO. It, we, we're five days after. It was Thursday. So we're going uh, April yeah. 9th. It was April 4th. Um, and... It's actually what it is, uh, technically, um, NATO, as we use the term, is sort of like this military organization. Um, what the 75th anniversary was of was the North Atlantic Treaty. And what that put into place was something called the North Atlantic Council. The North Atlantic Council is separate from the way that we use the word NATO, really. When we're talking about NATO, usually what we're talking about is like NATO forces. And NATO forces did not come into effect until 1951. So I'm just being, I'm being very pedantic here. It's 69 years since a combined NATO command structure came into place. Or it's 73 years since the combined NATO command structure came into place. It's 75 years since the North Atlantic Treaty was signed. And the North Atlantic Treaty, though, has in it the big article, a bunch of articles, but the big article is Article 5, which says 
an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. Um, I can actually read it out. I have it here. Uh, just to just to get it out of the way, because it's, it's a big one. It's an important one. Well, it, oh, but it did shouldn't you take very long for them to go from... It didn't take very long for them to go from treaties to a command structure. Because was they that always the plan, or no? But they realized in trying to come up with contingency plans. Um, I think the British were the ones who sort of realized the necessity for some sort of combined command structure, and they pushed the Americans to do it. But but um, so it was. It wasn't. It's not. There was never any offensive capabilities built into these command structures as far as I can tell. They're always about responding to an invasion from the Warsaw Pact as it would become uh, Russia. Um, there are some, when there are some offensive capabilities discussed in the post-war period, it's the only one that I can really find reference to is Churchill. And he, he orders the British High Command to do some, to create plans or something it's like called Operation Unthinkable, where the British in 1947 like, attack the Soviet Union, which sounds insane, um, and it would have been like the ballsiest move in history, uh, given the state of the British Empire in 1947. Um, but of course, Churchill... Oh, sorry, no, Churchill, because Churchill leaves in 45... So he, he has that, the the command, uh, British High Command, Imperial Staff draw up those plans, but they're, they're shelled. Uh, Atlee comes in in 45 and has no interest in attacking the Soviet Union. But it's, it's typical of Churchill, just insanity. Churchill is not a great military leader. He's a great, like, political leader, propagandist, unifier of, of people. But he's continually coming up with insane ideas that end up in disasters. But he's straight out of British military. But but those ideas are, in in essence, out of British military um, doctrine, strategic doctrine, doctrine, which is to open up as many fronts as possible. Because with superior naval forces, you'll, the British will be able to outmaneuver. So they can redirect troops wherever they want in via the Navy. Whereas a land power will continually be like responding to them. So the attack at Gallipoli was Churchill's idea and it was a disaster. But that principle of opening up another front on the Gallipoli Peninsula is, is typical British. Just... So great British strategy executed really poorly by Churchill. Um, anyway, the but so the the idea of of a unified command quickly becomes um, evidently necessary. So they signed. So the treaty signed in 1949. Um, but and so here we are, 75 years later. But uh, these are these two books have just come out. I've read both of them now. Um, they're very interesting. They do very different things. Um, the book by Peter Apps is more of a step-by-step -step history of NATO. Um, and it's a bit drier in the subject. It's, it's less philosophical. It's more history. Uh, but it's easy. It's, it's longer, but it's easier to read. Stan Rennings' NATO is more like a philosophy, the history of the philosophy of NATO. Um, it was a bit more difficult to get through, but it was shorter. Um, so, yeah. Have I steamrolled you, Jeff? I mean, re how have you been in this break? I, I feel like I, I've, uh, this little break that we had, <laughs> I feel like I didn't, we didn't get right. my chance. Um, you've I been, don't you want to bore everybody with my, you've been away, now you're back. My, yeah. <laughs> Did you see the I, eclipse? I took a small trip. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, Did you? It, it was was it only in North America? Uh there were parts of the UK that could see like partial bits of the eclipse, but not me. Um, and not yeah. England basically couldn't see any of it. And even if we had, it was cloudy. So, yeah. 
Um, yeah. All right, so I have three. Yeah, it was cloudy for me too. So I, I yeah. So sort of five parts to today. I'm gonna um, give you these three themes that I I think are important to understanding NATO. Uh, one is NATO's relationship with the military industrial complex, which is going to be very important to Eisenhower. Um, the second is the American empire uh, and its role in the world. And the third is the ideology of NATO. And I'm not, I'm not going to be critical of NATO. I'm, I'm actually like having read these two books about NATO. I'm not hostile to NATO. In fact, I'm, I'm lukewarm on NATO to say I'm positive about it, but I'm not, I'm not one of those gay NAFO guys, North Atlantic Friends Organization that want Ukraine in, in yesterday. Um, I think that's stupid. I think what I, what I am of what the, the sense in which I'm pro NATO is up until the end of the cold war. Um, and I'm pro NATO insofar as if Russia is a, I want I want the West to be trad and conservative and classically liberal. That's what I want. Uh, I don't think I don't have any particular animosity to Russia, but if Russia wants to fight a uh, the West, I'm going to side with the West. Now I know that the West is currently gay and stupid. But I, have, I hold out hopes that the West will turn itself around. And given that, I want the West to beat Russia if Russia is going to posture. And the, the, it, the problem is, is there's a chicken and the egg sort of thing that goes on with Russia and NATO and NATO expansion, which I will talk about in this episode. Um, but, yeah, I... I I'm, I, I appreciate the I appreciate both sides and the West certainly has antagonized Russia um, but I also want the West to win and I'm not ashamed of that right I'm a Western chauvinist the West is the best sorry um, I just don't want now now yeah I don't know I don't know who I want to win in weird pseudo trad Russia. That also has incredibly high abortion rates, and I don't know if you can actually make an argument that the Russian nation is actually trad versus Globo Homo America, American Empire. Yeah, I don't know who I want to win that, but I kind of see like I might be naive. You might disagree with me, but I first want to see. I want I want a, a classically liberal West to. Um, to triumph in in this, what what AA and Sargon would call, you know, I want a sensible centrist West to win. That's who I want to win history. Um, and yeah, I don't know where you fall on that, Jeff. Well, I can tell that, you know, you say that with a quite a bit of reluctance, and I think I'm kind of in that same boat. Where I have hope for the West, right? I, I have hope that, despite all of its problems, that the West can can still figure it out. Whereas, if Russia becomes world superpower or China becomes world superpower, it's kind of a huge setback. Um, I don't think either of those are going to happen. And, I, I don't. I don't think yeah, that's the well, the, the risk. Enough. I, because I, 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 I'm pretty convinced by Peter Zion, which I know sort of, if you know Zion, that sort of will get groans if you know who he is by a lot of people. But I'm pretty, con <laughs> I'm pretty convinced. Well, he, he's never had a single bad thing to say about America. He's, America has no weakness. So yeah, that's his weak know. spot. But I think his, I think he's, in so far as like putting on my Zion cap, the problem is not uh, Russia or China winning. Uh, the problem is the West losing. And by the West, I mean the collective West. Uh, America becoming the hermit kingdom. Europe sort of decaying. Because the real enemy, I to me, is uh, the global south. 
uh, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the global south. I want and and like as as Chris G says, yeah, Dugan's Dugan in the chat. Um, like Dugan, like if Russia is appealing to the global south, I really hate Russia. <laughs> like that's how to put it. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. so another way maybe I'd put it is that the West still represents the height of civilization. Yeah, 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 and and and, and this that's is why for me it's a good guy. The, because what's gonna happen? Either there's one of two things that are gonna happen. Either the West will persevere. And a West that is not centrally located in America, because I don't think America actually embodies the West in a spiritual sense. This is very quickly of me. Europe embodies the West. Um, and Canada and Australia and New Zealand embody the West um, in, in a spiritual in in, in the in the um, spiritual sense, in the cultural sense. America embodies the West in a physical sense in a material sense and um for better or worse those two have to be united but as quickly says if you lose the spiritual sense you'll it doesn't matter what the material culture is if you if you lose the non-material culture because any any material culture can be transferred to a different civilization so um and i don't think america actually does a good job at embodying the non-material culture of the West. So in a sense, the America needs the rest of the West to keep it, um, to keep it Western. Um, and, uh, but the rest of the West does not need America to keep it Western in other than to say maybe militaristically or p potentially economically, but I don't want to go down that road. Um, in, in this today, in today's episode, so they're so they're all they're yeah they're all related to one another. These three ideas, these um, and and here's my hot take, and this sort of what I just said alludes to this. My hot take is this: if you wanna, if you if you want to, and I'm gonna build on this in coming weeks, because uh, I'm gonna look at um, Anthony Sutton at some point very soon. Um, my hot take is this. The Cold War was a um, um, the Cold War was a way for America and the USSR to keep NATO to keep Europe enslaved, and NATO is the western half of Europe being kept in check. Um, uh, by America. And there's a very famous uh, saying, I think it was by the first or second Secretary General of NATO. Um, he was a British guy. I can't remember his name at the, at the, the moment. But he, fr he termed this phrase that um, the point of NATO was to keep America in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. So that that's the idea. NATO is very much built around keeping a strong european it's about keeping the russians out of out of western europe it's about keeping america involved in western europe and let me tell you uh what, if i have a bone to pick with trump it's the idea that america should not be involved in nato not because i want america involved in nato but because it would be the most retarded thing ever for america to to get out of nato for american interests it would be wildly in, in Europe's interest for America to abandon us. And, I'll, and I will get to that. But if America abandoned us, I think it would find some sort of, in a number of generations, a very powerful European state that was able to compete with it. So America is involved in Europe and NATO in order to prevent that happening. So my hot take is, that America and Russia somehow either implicitly, you know, probably implicitly, subconsciously, uh, NATO and the Warsaw Pact were meant to kind of keep Europe down. Um, so, first, a really quick history. Jeff, if I go on longer than 10 minutes, 
please yell at me. Here you have a map of NATO. Now, before you go looking at those very enticing red countries on the east, I want you to look at the western countries. There's ones in tan. And the founding members of NATO are the Benelux countries, which is Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, France, Italy, and Denmark, and Portugal. And then the UK, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Canada, and the US. Finland was never going to join early on. This map is out of date. Finland has since joined. Macedonia has since joined. Uh, Sweden has since joined. Um, uh, Austria, Sweden, and Finland, and Ireland never joined. Ireland is high. Um, don't expect Ireland to join NATO anytime soon. Because the condition Ireland has set for joining NATO is if it get if it's it'll only join NATO if it's given Northern Ireland uh, and the UK. The, uh, it, people who think that the British are somehow like clinging on to Northern Ireland uh, obstinately are just they don't know what's going on in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland still disproportionately wants to remain part of the United Kingdom. It was the part of the country that was most loyalist, and and they were not going to leave the UK. And so the agreement was the six counties in the north were going to stay as part of the UK. And when they, if should they ever vote to leave, then they can leave. Same with Scotland. We gave Scotland a referendum vote. Um, if Northern Ireland democratically votes to leave, they can leave. The UK is not going to go to war for Northern Ireland. I promise you that. Um, Sweden uh, um, had maintained neutrality through the First and Second World Wars. Uh, it sold a lot of Swedish iron to anybody with money, uh, including the Germans, and they intended to keep that going. Finland fought the Soviets into... They did lose, but they really bloodied the nose of the Soviets, and they sort of said, well, we're going to stay sort of neutral. Austria... Uh, don't really know where Austrian neutrality comes from. The Swiss are in there. They're neutral. Uh, so so that, that sort of Western uh, and Portugal what uh, is a part of it too. That That is what we were dealing with in 1949. Now in 1952 German, West Germany comes in. This isn't a great map. I don't know why I use this map. Now also I should say in 1949, there was this little uh, addendum, there was this little bit in the treaty that no longer exists, which references French Algeria. French Algeria was covered by the treaty, but it was removed in 1962, I think it was, when Algeria left. In 1955, they brought in uh, Greece and Turkey to cover that southern, uh, that southern flank. Uh, of the Black Sea. The British were very involved with these two countries. Um, in fact, Churchill did not want to bring Greece and Turkey into NATO. What he wanted was a separate organization govern governing the Eastern Mediterranean. That fell apart in 56 with the Suez Crisis. Um, Turkey felt kind of burned by that, if I recall correctly. And so the idea, though, was anyway before that, that they were going to be brought into NATO, and that's how they ended up there. Um, and then in 55, West Germany comes in. East Germany gets brought in uh, with reunification and is covered by... The NATO guarantee, but the agreement Yeltsin had was that, and no, it was to Yeltsin's understanding that first, no NATO resources would be deployed in the former territory of East Germany, but then that kind of wiggled out. The problem with Yeltsin, I'll come back to Yeltsin in a second. Uh, 82, Spain. Now, in a lot of these cases, in a lot of these cases, is it that the, con the country on the outside wants in or that NATO wants to recruit the country that's not in yet? With Greece and Turkey, I think NATO wants them. With West Germany, I think it's both. 
And because West Germany in... I mean, it was almost guaranteed by NATO anyway, because had they rolled... Had the East... Had the communist... Had there been a communist invasion of West Germany, the US, the UK, and France were stationed in West Germany. And they were going to fight anyway. The big concern... With, but the other thing about bringing West Germany into NATO is that it keeps West Germany where the Allies can see it. There's a lot of concern about how West Germany was going to engage with East Germany and how eventual unification would happen. And the West was worried that a, uh, a neutral-ish West Germany could reunify with East Germany and that they could either go communist or pro-Russia or worse, they could start to get independent and pursue an independent agenda. Um, this that's a good and that's a good question as well because it brings me out to this idea. The what what the US is doing with this uh, with I mean Depending upon which of these books you look at, you'll you'll get two different stories about how NATO was created. Peter App said that the seed of NATO was um, the seed of NATO existed in this Dunkirk Treaty between Britain and France. Uh, Stan Rinning says that it happened uh, with some Americans being pushed by British people. Um, to be to maintain an involvement in Europe. One of the interesting things about NATO is it definitely we know this. It definitely is developed by mid-level uh, guys in the Department of State uh, and and mid-level bureaucrats in Canada. And the Canadians are actually the Canadians have a really disproportionately large influence on the for founding NATO document. Uh, Article two of, of the founding document says. The parties will contribute toward the further development of peaceful and friendly international relations by strengthening their free institutions, by bringing about a better understanding of the principles upon which these institutions are founded, and by promoting conditions of stability and well-being. They will seek to eliminate conflict in their international economic policies and will encourage economic collaboration between any or all of them. Um, that is... Uh, uh, that is massively pushed by um, a Canadian diplomat. I can't remember his name at the moment. Uh, and, and it's one of the mo most significant articles of the treaty. Um, and it sort of... It, it, pl it plants the ideological flag for NATO. And what happens is NATO is... The Americans are trying to build a cooperative defense pact that is built off of liberal ideology. The alternative, as the Americans see it, is that it's it will be back to the bad old ways for Europe, which is balance of power diplomacy in which you're looking at your peer competitors and your neighbors, and you're figuring out who is actually a threat to you, who you can make compromises with, who you can get an edge over, and, and that that's what led to First and Second World Wars, these blocks these balance of power blocks forming. And the Americans think that the best thing for world peace uh, is to avoid that developing. And even though NATO looks like balance of power politics uh, to a Soviet or a Russian, it isn't. Because anybody can join NATO. There's no, there's no like limit on the number of people that can join NATO. Um, anyone can join... As long as they meet these these ideas, and it, but you have to be a liberal democracy to join NATO. <coughs> um, so the uh, and then uh, throughout the Cold War, NATO NATO kind of uh, oscillates between being um, pragmatic about its defense to being ideological. Actually, counterintuitively, the uh, European countries are very pro-nuclear weapons. They're very pro-nuclear weapons, short and medium-range nuclear weapons being stationed in Europe 
Because what they're afraid of is America withdrawing from Europe um, or withdrawing nuclear weapons from Europe, and, or either of those two, and thereby losing an umbrella of protection. And what, the, what Western Europe really doesn't want to happen is to be the front line in a war between America and Russia. And you can see this by... Um, the Russians have very limited strike capabilities against the U.S. Uh, all throughout the Cold War um, because of geography. And the U.S., because of it has having NATO, has very good strike capabilities. And if you'll go back and watch the episode that I did about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis for Quigley. Um, incidentally, I'm hoping to do another episode, a more in-depth episode on that at some point because I have the new Max Hastings book on the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, but I haven't read it yet. Um, but that's that's very far down the road. Um, the The problem was that um, the U.S. could maintain short and medium range missiles in the UK and in Italy and in Turkey and uh, in the Netherlands, Germany, but, and Russia was trying to get a similar advantage with Cuba. And the Americans said, no, that's the, that, you're, you're not, we're not going to let you do that for a whole bunch of reasons. And, um, and the, the Americans are actually kind of constantly thinking about drawing down through the Cold War drawing down short and medium range nuclear weapons or not keeping them as modernized as they could be. And the Europeans are always very eager that they should do that because of maintaining protection in Europe. That leads me to another point. One of the things that begins to happen is when West Germany comes in, when you look at a map of uh, West Ger Germany, there's this thing called the Fulda Gap. And the Fulda Gap was this war game scenario over and over and over about how are we going to stop uh, the Eastern communist tanks rolling through the Fulda Gap. Because one part of geography of Germany in the south that allows, you know, masses of troops to roll through. Um, the rest, Germany is sort of divided by forests and mountains and the Fulda Gap provides a way out, a way through that. And the, the West Germans were very keen for NATO to develop a doctrine of defending at the border. They didn't want to fall back because they were worried if the NATO plans look something like, well, we'll fall back to the Rhine. Well, then that's all the Germany gone. And we don't want that. And if all of Germany is gone and, there's some, and, and there is a peace settlement, what it will mean is... West Germany will just become part of East Germany, and and the so, and that will come to be very important in today in 2024, because the same worry is what Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland have, that their borders are not treated as, um, that their borders are treated as as where the fight begins. They don't want NATO to fall back. And it's one of the great weaknesses of NATO, that they let Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in, which are not strategically placed for the NATO map at all. It's one of the things that points to the ideology, right? If you were NATO, why the hell, and you were thinking about grand strategy, why the hell would you let Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in? There's no, it's, it's I mean, if I was, if I was, there, there's a position called the Supreme Allied Commander um, of Europe, which is it's Sacker, and Sacker is always an American. And uh, if I was Sacker, I would be I would lose sleep at night about Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and pretending like we could we could defend their borders as the front line. It's just insane, um, uh, and it, and it, of course it antagonizes Russia. Now, in 1982, Spain comes in. You see that. 1999, uh, Hungary, um, the Czech Republic, and Poland come in. In 2004, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, Bulgaria come in. 
Slovenia or Croatia and Albania came in in 2009. Uh, Macedonia came in. Montenegro has come in. I think I have another map down here. Yeah. Montenegro, North Macedonia came in. Uh, and of course, in the last year or two, Finland came in and then Sweden came in after Finland, even though they applied at the same time because Erdogan uh, was was trying to beef up his Islamic credentials by slowing down Sweden's application because some Swedish Democrat burned a Quran in Sweden. So Erdogan slowed that their application down. Um, that makes me feel a little bit better <laughs> as Sacker that Sweden and Finland are in. Sweden has an incredible navy, especially an incredible um, shallow water submarine capabilities. Um, Finland has an incredible citizen army. Um, so th those are assets. Those are assets. Um, Ukraine is not going to be an asset for um, for. NATO, it will be a massive liability, but I'm thinking strategically. I'm not thinking ideologically. Um, Bosnia is probably is on the cards. Armenia is on the cards. Georgia is on the cards. Um, Kosovo is on the cards. Um, practically the only country in Central Europe that has an or that isn't neutral that will not join will be Serbia, although there's a significant pro-Western faction of Serbia that would love to join, um, as they would love to join the EU, and Belarus. Uh, Belarus isn't going to join uh, as long as Lukashenko is, is there. Um, and since the... since I, I'm going to talk more about the post-Cold War history, um, but uh, uh, what, what, really, what really starts to unify NATO is... Uh, in 1951, Truman is looking at the state of Europe, and he realizes that the, there needs to be some sort of unified command. And Truman goes to Eisenhower, who is in retirement. And he's, I believe at the, this time, he's the president of Columbia University. Quigley points out, uh, the, 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 someone in, on the faculty of Columbia University asks a friend of his who they should get for the next president of Columbia. And his friend goes, oh, you need Eisenhower. And they meant Eisenhower's cousin. Uh, and, and the guy went, oh, that's a good idea. And so they just asked Dwight Eisenhower to be president. Um, Truman goes to him and says, I need you. I need you to come out of retirement. And I need you to put together a command structure for managing a potential war in Europe using NATO. So Eisenhower comes out. He spends 18 months. And he puts together a command structure. He develops a number of theater commands. Uh, and the Americans lead two out of three or four of them. Um, the, the British are always the deputy sacker. The uh, British general is always a deputy sacker. And the French were head of operations while they remained in the NATO command structure. De Gaulle pulls, pulls France out of the NATO military structure in 66, I believe, because he realizes that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he had lost control of French military assets. And he started giving orders about to the French Navy. And one of the admirals said, we can't. That asset is currently under control of NATO. And de Gaulle didn't like that. Uh, although de Gaulle was massively on side during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He didn't like that. So he pulls out uh, French from the military side. They remain involved in the political side. They continue to sit on the North Atlantic Council. Uh, and then Sarkozy, 10, 15 years ago, comes in and he puts... Uh, French back into the military structure of NATO, um, and they're back in. Now, there's a whole lot more to the history of NATO. Um, the, the interesting negotiations and relationships within the, uh, the alliance. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, I could spend all night, but I, I want to get into these three th themes. Now, the first really interesting theme is that Eisenhower, this is this is a screenshot of Eisenhower at his during his farewell address, which famously warns people about the military industrial complex. The other thing that he warns about that people forget in this address is he says there's two problems. There's the military industrial complex and then there's the scientific managerial complex that's forming. Uh, and these two are paired together. Now, <clears throat> you might think that after eight years of being president, that that's where Eisenhower started to worry about the military industrial complex. It is not. It is, in fact, during these 18 months that he is um, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe from 1950 to 1951, incidentally, which is used to... to propel him into running for president because people start going to him and saying you got to do it you got to you got to run for president because the other the republican alternative is robert taft the son or grandson of, of the former president taft he's isolationist we need a non-isolationist republican to run you've set up the uh, combined military command of Europe. You know how important it is to keep America involved in Europe, which I'm going to talk about later. You know how important it is to keep America involved in Europe. You got to do it. And it is during those 18 months in Eisenhower's diaries that he starts to realize the enormous military spending that America engaged in in the Second World War couldn't stop. It had to keep rolling in order to create a credible deterrence against the Soviet Union and what would become the Warsaw Pact. So, here we are. It's uh, 22 years after the Cold War has ended, and we were promised when the Cold War ended that there was going to be a peace dividend. And the peace dividend was going to be the either the reduction in taxes or the increase in other areas of public spending that were going to be freed up now that the West didn't have to spend billions of dollars on creating a credible deterrence to the Soviet Union. That did decline for three or four years, and now it's back up. Uh, and you can blame the war on terror, but I think that the Allies, having read these two books, the honeymoon period with Russia never really occurred. Uh, and in the, in the late 90s, there's still a significant concern about Russia. But the only time that there's really not a concern about Russia is with Bush Jr. because he has blinders on for the war on terror. But um, military spending has not gone anywhere. So it's, it's you know, um, Eisenhower gave the military industrial speech in um, January 1961. He's about, it's like the week that Kennedy gets sworn in. Um, and so it's what, uh, 63 years later and the military industrial complex is still a problem here. You have NATO spending as a percentage, um, Greece there is an outlier. I don't know what's going on with Greece in 2022. I think that is some sort of modernization drive. Um, I can't account for it. I'm sure there's a good explanation. There's America next at nearly 3.5% of GDP. Then you got Poland at 2%. Two, uh, 2%. Most consistent after the U.S. is Britain, United Kingdom down here uh, at 2.12%. That's the second largest total expenditure. And the and so of the guys meeting their two percent obligation. So okay, the, where does the two percent obligation come from? Before I go any further, the two percent obligation is stated in 2014 at um, the Wales conference, and they make this thing called the Wales Declaration. And the Wales Declaration happens because of the invasion of Crimea by Russia, 
And the West says, we got to have a minimum spending for NATO. And it's going to take 10 years before anyone, before that, that cap comes in. But, but 10% by 2024. We are just coming, we're just there now. So Trump posturing about defense spending has been irrelevant up till now. The Allies never had any obligation to in any formal obligation to spend 2% of GDP on on defense and even though Merkel made a stupid Trump Trump said that Merkel was everything that he hated about politics um, Merkel tried to convince Trump that um, other spending should be factored in to that 2% and that you know giving money to develop you know Afghanistan should be included in that. The Americans are not interested in that, but there is some middle ground between those two positions, which says things like intelligence assets um, and various sort of um, uh, border protections, things like that, ought to be accounted for. And so there's there's some there's some in between there, but the only but but here we are and. Um, the only countries that are actually anywhere near to meeting that 2% are going from left to right. Greece, the United States, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, United Kingdom, Latvia, Croatia, Slovak, uh, Slovakia, and Romania is just beneath it. France is 5% short. Um, the Netherlands are... Uh, um, What's the number there? Uh, it's like about 18% short. Norway is short. Hungary is significantly short. Italy is like 25% short. Germany is 25 plus percent short. Um, Canada is significantly short, like by a third. Turkey is short. Um, and, and you can see from that that the Eastern European countries are very serious about their defense. Spain is the, the largest economy. Um, the, 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 the one on the far right is Luxembourg. You know, fair enough. Fair enough. Luxembourg can spend a quarter, per, uh, like half a percent, and nobody's really going to say anything. Nobody's bothered. Spain is at the other end of Europe, and it spends one percent, half of the, the commitment that it needs to. It committed to um, in the Wales Declaration. So there's a huge amount of money being spent. This is this is the point of this this military industrial complex. There's a lot of money here, and it's quickly taught us military spending is a significant part of the modern Keynesian equation. If your economy is doing badly, you can pump money into it. To, in, and the way that you pump money into it is via public spending. And one of the best areas for public spending in terms of like this weird accounting exercise is weapons. Because they sit there. They don't create a weapons inflation um, because there's only one buyer of weapons, the government. And they can sit there and wait to be used. Now, I don't know how well this is going to show up. This is a comparison of NATO versus Russia men and equipment. NATO has 7.5 million uh, military personnel. Russia has 3.5. This is from 2023. Um, active soldiers, NATO outnumbers Russia about 3 to 1 with 3.3, 3.4 million. Um, uh, aircraft um, uh, are... NATO has 22,000 versus Russia's 4.8,000. Uh, 4 in terms of fighter aircraft, uh, dogfighters, if you will, it's 3,200 versus 800. Battle tanks um, is one where Russia wins. Oh, attack, attack helicopters, 1,400 attack helicopters versus 559. Battle tanks, Russia's currently winning... Uh, NATO has uh, 11,390. Russia has 14,777. But the... I mean, I, I'm sorry, Russia bros, but your tanks suck. I don't care what, what there's... I don't care how badly 
Ukrainians are at using tanks. Um, hold on a second. By the way, guys, don't forget to hit that like button and uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Sorry, I just needed a drink really badly all of a sudden. Um, I don't okay. care. I don't care how good, how badly a Ukrainian tank crew that's had three weeks of training uses an M1 Abrams. The M1 Abrams we know, we know from Iraq, will tear through Russian tanks like a hot knife through butter. Um, if NATO and Russia ever go to war, I wouldn't be surprised if um, the tank casualty rates were something like 8 to 1. That one, one NATO tank per 8 Russian tanks was lost. Um, and, and it has... And because the pro one of the reasons why the Ukrainians are doing badly with their tanks is because it's one part of a complete combat doctrine... They don't have the other assets uh, that go with that combat doctrine. They're not using those tanks as they're designed to be. The NATO tanks were fun are fundamentally designed to be um, to sit back and snipe at oncoming Russian tanks coming through the Fulda Gap, and the Na the Ukrainians are desperate to gain ground, and they're throwing armored assets into these. Poorly executed, poorly manned things. So that battle tank figure uh, doesn't worry me. Uh, conversely, the those fighter figures. If I was if I was the Russian uh, if I if I was Shorgu, the the Russian Minister of Defense, I would be losing sleep about fighter aircraft because I promise you. Uh, as, as great as Russia is at making some amazing aircraft, it's not great at making them en masse. And those 3,200 uh, fighters and interceptors are a hell of a lot of F-16s, a hell of a lot of F-18s, F-35s, F-22s. The Russians don't have anything that can compare to those. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really being realistic here. I don't... I, I don't I, I don't care that that we have better aircraft. I think it's just, it's just obvious. The Russian Navy is nothing compared to the combined um, the combined uh, Western NATO navies. Um, you know, we there's like fourteen or fifteen supercarriers between America's thirteen and Britain's one and a half because one of them is permanently broken. Um, the uh, well, where was that? Yeah, so so, um, the one may, maybe you might worry about Russian submarines. I don't particularly. I expect them to have the same maintenance issues of all other Russian military equipment we've seen in the last two years. There's a story about um. The British and uh, Americans attack submarines. At one point, they had. Now, this is an apo uh, apocryphal story. It might be true. It might not be true. But there is a story that goes around that during the Cold War, um, they had every Russian submarine on that was at sea accounted for. And one day, they just actively. So there's two types of sonar. There's passive and active. Passive just listens. Active sends a sound wave out at a specific target and bounces it back. The problem with active is if you p it's called pain. If you ping someone, they know that you're pinging them. And they know where you are. So actually quite a lot of sonar done by submarines is passive. They don't use active very often. But on this coordinated day... Uh, they actively pinged every Russian submarine at sea. I don't know if that's a true story or not. It's a story I've heard from a number of sources. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, if you had done that, if that had, if that did happen, I promise you there would have been a lot of nervous guys uh, in the Kremlin um, because what that means is one of the biggest credible deterrents is 
the um, the missile subs with the ICBMs on. Uh, and if the NATO and the Allies could have uh, preemptively struck Russia, they could have also preemptively destroyed the retaliatory um, missile subs. The missile subs, in terms of nuclear doctrine, function as a strike back capability. They're not a first strike capability. What you what the idea was that if nuclear war were to happen, the first strike would come from land. And then the retaliatory strike from the opponent would wipe out the land assets. And then the thing that you would then use um, to say, well, if you got all my land assets, or, or you would launch your, in a preemptive strike, you would launch your missiles at their land assets. And when you could put nukes on a sub and move them anywhere in the world and have them pop up in the middle of nowhere and send nuclear missiles uh, wherever you wanted. That was a, another layer to deterrence because it went, you're not going to get all of my nuclear subs. Well, if the combined Allied navies did actually pull this off where they actively pinged uh, and letting, every, letting the Russians know that they knew that they were there and they had every nuclear attack uh, missile sub pinged, that would have caused a lot of headache uh, and, and would have would have uh, really undermined the Russian confidence in their ability to um, effectively conduct a nuclear um, a nuclear attack. Again, the one place that Russia kind of balances is in nuclear warheads. Uh, I'm not particularly worried about that. Um, again, I don't I don't have a lot of confidence in the maintenance of those warheads. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence in the maintenance of anybody's warheads, really. Russia, uh, um, sorry, China uh, was recently, there was a scandal in China that a the general who was in charge of China's nuclear missiles had been busted um, for selling the fuel meant to launch those, meant to be put into those nuclear missiles, and instead the forces had been filling them up with water. Um, the British cannot effectively launch their Trident missiles in tests. We have twice in the past 12 months, 18 months, conducted missile te uh, missile launch tests with our nuclear missile, our, our um, subs at sea. Uh, both times they failed. Um, I don't know what the American nuclear uh, arsenal looks like. It's probably the one I would have the most confidence in. Um, I don't know what the French one looks like. Uh, I'm agnostic. About, I'm, I have no opinion. Um, India and Pakistan, I think, probably have enough capable nukes to eliminate one another's capital cities, but I don't know how much more than that they have. And Israel, of course, is out there lurking with the Samson option. Uh, if you don't know about the Samson option, it's a particularly evil idea where if Israel's uh, looks like it's about to be overwhelmed, they're going to fire nukes. Now, I don't have a problem with that. Their plan is not to fire nukes at the Arab countries invading them. Their plan is to fire nukes at the European capitals and saying, if you let us fall, we're taking you down with us. So there are nuclear, there are Israeli nuclear missiles aimed at London, Paris, and Berlin just to spite Europe. Now, if you want to know why I think that America and the USSR, uh, that, that the Cold War was a way of keeping down Europe, I would also point to Israel having that option. And I'm also going to point to Anthony Sutton and talk about, in weeks to come, uh, Wall Street and the Bolshevik alliance. Now, what commonality Wall Street and the Bolsheviks had and that the Samson option has, I leave it to you to make that connection. Um, this is a look at what the current... That is, that is mind-blowing. <laughs> Which what I mean, part? We titled today, 75 years of... The Samson option. 
We titled today 75 Years of Europe in Captivity, but I didn't know it was going to get that real. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, did, I didn't know it was either. I, it just came to me as I was talking about nuclear weapons. Um, um, I, they hate Europe. They hate Europe. And the, the, um, they want to keep Europe down. And that's unconvinced. And Europe as Christendom. I'm convinced that it's Europe as Christendom. Um, so. This is the combined defense spending of NATO. Um, United States makes up 53% of the uh, NATO combined GDP. It makes up about 63 to 68% of defense spending. You can see there the combined NATO defense spending is one trillion dollars. One trillion. Uh, incidentally, that's one percent of global GDP. One percent of global GDP is spent on NATO defense. Um, that's been, as you see, it's kind of trending upwards um, over the last decade. Um, the that 2016, 2017, 2018, uh, that's uh, that's Obama, and then that upswing there is um, Trump and Trump lighting a fire under the uh, Euro European allies' butts. Incidentally, Canada doesn't really have to meet that two percent. It does, but it doesn't because. Um, Canada lives under the protection of America anyway, so it, who cares, right? Like, they could easily avoid um, avoid spending it. But they, you know... Um, this is what the new membership has done to bump the figures. Um, as you can see, Finland significantly bumps it. You know, bringing in Albania and Herzegovina... Uh, didn't didn't do a lot. In fact, it decreased it. Um, but uh, that's also um, you know people thinking the war on terror is winding down. And then 2014, Russia invades Ukraine, and it's going back up again. That's this is just to give you an idea of the numbers of equipment and men and dollars that go into NATO. And to recall, at the beginning, I talked about Eisenhower and his. Awareness of what it would mean to spend all this money. What it would mean to protect democracy. And Eisenhower was aware. There is this tension between the... Uh, Jeff's just gone. There's this tension between the requirements of defending Western uh, liberalism and implementing a set of militaristic policies that were going to directly uh, contradict that Western liberalism. Um, how how um, cynical you are about that Western liberalism, I leave up to you. But that's, um, that's where we are. Uh, I'm going to keep pushing on. I want to talk now about NATO as the global American empire. Um, this is a location of all American military uh, bases around 2015. Um, you can get rid of the ones in Afghanistan. Um, some of these are obviously in allied countries in Germany or in Britain. Some of them are in places that are kind of like borderland. Um, Diego Garcia is a, one of the most significant bases in the world. It controls the Indian Ocean, and it's on um, some islands that the British control. They're British overseas territories. The, the native Chagosians are always agitating to get it back. But you can see here the spread of the American empire. Uh, here's another one. This is an old map um, because it has Russia in it. These are the... Uh, um, countries that have some sort of re relationship to NATO. Uh, Russia was on it. I don't know what the current status of Russia is. The ones in orange are called uh, PFPs. They're membership of programs that are called Partnerships for Peace. 
Um, I don't know anything about the Mediterranean Dialogue. I don't know anything about the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative or the Individual Partnership Action Plan. Um, I don't know about the Enhanced Opportunity Partners, but they are... Um, that's Ukraine and uh, Armenia or Georgia um, and Jordan. I don't know what Jordan uh, plans are, but but Ukraine and Georgia are on track to. They're 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 trying to figure out a way how we can bring them in. Um, the green ones are the global partners, and the global partners are effectively in. NATO, um, I don't know if Iraq still is. They're they're effectively NATO members that are not covered by Article Five. One of the debates about NATO is is it is it should we expand it out of the North Atlantic area into other parts of the world? And the prevailing attitude is no, we shouldn't do that. But we can have a lot of overlapping and cooperative um, plans that. Uh, accomplish similar things to NATO that NATO does, but just in other parts of the world. But, you know, if anybody attacks Australia, I, the large percentage of NATO is going to come in and join. I'm quite, I'm quite sure of that. Now, Trump likes to fuss about American military spending with NATO, but as I said, America has a vested interest in uh, in staying involved with NATO, regardless of how much the other European countries spend. America has constantly been pushing since the beginning for the members to have bigger militaries and to take leadership. <clears throat> and many people will criticize countries like Germany and being able to afford generous social welfare programs because I, I'm sorry, there's some weird like thing in my mouth, some weird metallic taste. Um, the uh, that the European countries can afford military programs or, or social welfare programs because America subsidizes their military spending, and my response to that is that is the cost of empire. America has a vested interest in staying involved in Europe, preventing Europe from unifying, and covering that bill. If you think America can just withdraw to the Western Hemisphere, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. What I think is that enough members of the American military and strategic and, and diplomatic uh, side of things uh, subscribe to basically uh, Halford McKinder's idea, which we talked about an episode or two ago, about the heartland theory. Um, and incidentally, I think the British do too. Uh, the British maintained this doctrine of not prior to Halford McKinder coming along, for hundreds of years, the British maintained a doctrine of, of trying to prevent any single power on the continent from getting so powerful that it can dominate the Eurasian landmass. America has inherited that doctrine. There's enough met people in the American establishment that have adopted that perspective. Now, they might have adopted that perspective because of Going back again to Quigley and the Anglo-American establishment, the Round Table Program and the Milner Group. Uh, because what happens? Well, if you remember, the British set the Milner Group sets up the Royal Institute of International Affairs. The Royal Institute of International Affairs then sets up a spin-off in America. That spin-off in America is called Jeff. Do you remember? Quiz, quiz for the chat. Council on Foreign Relations. Council on Foreign Relations. And that is the way... Um, AA posted this meme that he was like, some people actually believe this. And Let me see if I can find it. Um, it's quite... It, it, it was amusing. Um, um, 
Let's have a look here. I'll find. I'll find it quickly. The 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 view is essentially that somehow uh, the British control America, and that America then controls the world. Now, I don't think that that is. Uh, and AA says like, oh, this is really stupid. Some people actually think this is true. Yes and no is my response. Because if you think back to what I've just said about the um, Royal Institute of International Affairs and using um, the Council on Foreign Relations as a way of nudging uh, things, then you get that idea. There's there, All of a sudden... There's a lot more um, <clears throat> um, validity to... I, I'm, I can't find it. Uh, there's a lot more validity to the... Um, to the idea that actually the British are, are not bad at keeping... at nudging America in terms of policy in the right in the direction that they want. Now, I happen to think that generally that turns out to be a good thing. And in fact, the problem with American policy is that it's not controlled by the British. Uh, I know that um, there's more than enough Anglo haters out there who have a weird psychosis about England and the English and the British, and uh, <laughs> which I kind of like. Um, I, I, you know, it kind of tells me it's we've been doing something right. Um, but anyway, uh, um, the British do actually kind of control uh, um, American policy in some way. And one of the ways that they've gotten America to embody some British values is preventing anyone from unifying... Um, on the continent, which is what I think NATO functions as. I think NATO functions as a way of preventing any powers from uh, becoming so powerful on the continent. And it's what I, it's that quote that I said um, at the beginning that the goal of NATO is to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. You try. Oh, here it is. Um, trying to keep the Germans down amounts to Mackinder's thesis that if, if Germany were ever to uh, get so powerful that it could just um, act, um, then it would be able to do, you know, dominate the world because of that. This is it. Uh, if you've seen this lately, uh, I do like it. Uh, I wish it were true. It's not, it's not true enough. That's a problem. Um, but if anyone if anyone could ever unite the heartland, um, it would then quickly dominate the uh, the outer lands, the the world, the the the, um, the peripheral islands, and America is one of them. And America as uh, as an entity, North America as an entity, is an amazing place. The Western Hemisphere is an amazingly resource-rich place. It cannot st stand up to a unified Eurasian power. Um, and so I don't think America can afford to, um, to disengage from Europe based upon Mackinder and the Heartland Theory. And I think the underlying um, NATO, both during the Cold War and after the Cold War, the prime motivator is the Heartland Theory. And I, when we talked about the Heartland Theory, um, I mentioned, uh, what's his name, Z Zabinski? Um, uh, yeah, and he, and he was writing uh, in like 1992, 1993, maybe 94, that the U.S. should pay a lot of attention to Central Asia. And he, he said that largely out of... Um, mckinder ideology uh because if you can keep central asia if you can maintain the status quo in central asia of these fractured 
um, countries making life difficult for the Russians and the Chinese, that does a lot of work for you to keep um, anyone unifying uh, in the heartland. That is my thought about the American Empire. That, with what I said about um, um, Russia and America colluding to keep Europe down, and the Samson option, uh, uh, says quite a bit about uh, why why NATO exists as a military organization. Why does NATO exist as a ideological organization. Here's a here's a clip I found, a little um, screenshot. What does a pride parade have to do with NATO? More than you might think from the Brookings Institute. NATO is fundamentally an ideological group. It is not fundamentally a military group. Um, it was set up to as a partnership of, con- of liberal countries that shared ideology and could agree on what they wanted the world to look like in terms of, you know, freedoms, not communist, not fascist. And a big part of, um, and their, their ideological values have shifted. And this is in part the story of liberalism, not the story of NATO that I'm going to tell you. This is, uh, obviously, this is uh, FDR and Churchill, and this was when they signed something called the Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter was the precursor to the UN, and in many ways, NATO is the UN without all the um, difficult countries. It's all the uh, liberal European countries that are prepared to act in defense of UN principles and not let the UN get hijacked by countries like Russia and China. So the Atlantic Charter is sort of the root of both of them, both the UN and NATO. And the UN would come to start to use NATO as a military arm in some ways, because, especially in the Balkans. So there were many UN forces that during the Serbian aggressions, if you want to call them that, against their neighbors or the the, the former Yugoslav um, members as they were breaking off, the UN will launch a um, some sort of like peacekeeping operation, which sucks. And then they'll look to NATO, and NATO will either take over the, the peacekeeping operation or it will put in forces parallel to the UN. Um, <clears throat> but the Atlantic Charter embodies this sort of liberal ideology and that we need to protect this liberal, ideo- a liberal ideology. Now, uh, and as I said, uh, a big part of that liberal ideology, but a big part of how that how strategy came to operate in conjunction with that liberal ideology was the West German insistence that NATO defend West Germany at the border, not at some fallback position. Now, uh, here are two guys who, if you're not being conspiratorial about Tony Blair, you can say both of these guys are liberals. They're liberals at different ends of the spectrum, but they're both liberals. On the left is Conrad Adenauer. Adenauer was the mayor of Cologne, and um, he was a member of the Christian Democrats in Germany. He made his name and reputation in post-war Germany by being one of the Christian Democrats that stood up to Hitler. And he was jailed. Uh, He was, I believe he was put into a concentration camp. And he survived the war, and he came out, and he was the conservative that the Allies wanted. The Allies did not want to give West Germany over to a social democrat, and frankly, the Germans didn't want anyone who would be pro-communist. They couldn't have uh, an ex-Nazi, so Adenauer it, it was. 
And that slogan is one of my favorite slogans of any political campaign I've ever I've ever come across. Kinda experimenta, no experiments. Let's not mess around, guys. Let's just let's just how about we just run the country in a way that will work instead of doing social engineering. Uh, so uh, West Germany has uh, a real boom under Adenauer, but he is the right side and he's a uh, he's the conservative side of being liberal and he's a pragmatist there you have blair and this is a sign from kosovo um tony blair a leader a friend a hero now at one point the most popular name for boys in kosovo was tony because of tony blair Tony Blair was very significant in dragging... Bill Clinton really didn't want to do anything in Kosovo. He just wanted to have uh, troops in the... Um, 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 a no-fly zone and a bombing campaign. The bombing campaign did not work out so well for um, a number of reasons with when it was Bosnia and Serbia. And so... Which, which America just botched anyway um, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. And Blair was quite insistent, we need, we need people in on the ground. We need, we need to do this. Um, and so Blair pushes a left-wing liberal, globalist, and very ideologically liberal, as opposed to Adenauer's pragmatic liberal. I'm a classical liberal, which in part I take to mean a pragmatic liberal. Um, so Blair then pushes the NATO into this new era. The NATO of Adenauer, the NATO of the Cold War, is made up of, going back to this, this one, all these tan countries, none of the red ones, right? The, the tan and the dark tan countries and the orange Spain. Um, these countries have an ideology that's very cautious in its application. Poland a number of times, the Czech Republic a number of times, Hungary a number of times, uh, are, is teetering on the, on the brink. Sorry, Czechoslovakia is teetering. Um, they're, they're going through upheavals. And NATO's approach is we're going to push gently, but we're not going to be retarded. We're not going to start a nuclear war over Poland. We're not going to start a nuclear war over Hungary. That attitude is very pragmatic. It's very Adenauer. The attitude of more, 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 now, 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 faster, 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 is very Blair. What we're living with with Ukraine is very Blair. Um, it's worse than Blair. It's it's very it's very um, girl. It's it's the next step of Blair. It's the girl boss diplomacy. Um, Slay Queen. Yeah, bring Ukraine in. Yeah, it'll be great. Um, we'll show those Russians. Um, and the ideology is taken over. Now, combined with, with this new ideological liberalism is combined the membership of particularly the Baltic Three, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Romania to a lesser extent, Bulgaria to a lesser extent, Slovakia to a lesser extent, are worried about Russia. Um, but... The Czech, uh, Slovakia has just elected a pro-Russian guy. Uh, Orban has been in power in Hungary for a decade or more. He's pro. He's he's. He, I think Orban is actually walks a nice middle line. I don't think he's actually pro-Russia. I just don't think he's as anti-Russia as um, the West wants him to be. Bulgaria, I can tell you from. Uh, via the mouth of a Bulgarian that I talk to quite often. Bulgaria loves Russia. They still love Russia. They elected a progressive guy who was very pro-West, but the but even the left-wing like guys, people that voted him for him in Bulgaria, 
they're very pro-Russia. Because places like Bulgaria and Serbia have a long memory. And they remember Russia as the Slav big brother who helped free them from Turkey. So Serbia and Bulgaria are pro-Russia. But Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania have been living under the boot of Russia for a very long time. Poland was was divided um, at the beginning of World War One. Poland was divided by uh, in, uh, into the three empires of Germany, Austro-Hungary, and Russia. It gained independence for twenty years. It fights off a Russian communist invasion. It it maintains independence until nineteen thirty nine, when Russia and Germany divide it. Um, and it, and then it lives under it, the Second World War starts about Polish sovereignty, and Churchill can't do anything about it in the post-war realpolitik situation. So he he, he lets Stalin have Poland because there's nothing he can do about it anyway. On the agreement that Stalin is gonna stay out of Greece, so that was the agreement about Poland. Uh, similarly, and then it, and then it lives under the Warsaw Pact until 1989, 1991. You know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the USSR, and it does not want to relive that. So it has very high military spending. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, these three independent Baltic countries in the interwar period, uh, they. Um, get conquered by Russia um, and brought into the Soviet Union. Poland is not in the Soviet Union. It's an independent country nominally, but in the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact is the USSR and the countries in between it and uh, Western Europe. Russia... um, brings the Baltic countries into the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union collapses, many parts of it start to just declare independence. The The one place that Russia is quite determined to hold on to is the Baltics. And the Baltics, though, are quite determined to leave. Um, and they, um, in one of them, I can't remember which one, there's a quite a significant massacre of pro-independence people by Russians. You know, dozens of people being killed by Russians. And eventually Yeltsin just realizes he can't, he's not going to make this work, and he pulls out. Now those, so those four countries have a long memory of what's, what Russia and the Soviet Union will has did to them. And they are not eager to relive it. But what they have done by joining NATO is they have changed the corporate culture of NATO. Prior to their membership, we had Adenauer, guys that were very cautious about provoking Russia, eager to eager to de-escalate. There's a long tradition in Russia of something called Ostpolitik, East politics, uh, where they disentangle military and diplomacy from one another, and they keep diplomacy attached to trade. Where, as opposed to diplomacy attached strongly to the military, um, and there, and Ostpolitik was very big on engaging the East and bringing the East on side gradually, never threatening the East with mil- the, their military, bringing it on side, engaging in trade, and spreading soft soft power via trade. These. Four countries, though, are not interested in that. They're not interested in Ostpolitik. And they are very, very feisty and very, very afraid of being left in the lurch. And they actually kind of escalate things, um, I think, because of that nature. And so they've gotten rid of that conservative pragmatism and they've embraced a very, um, a very, like, ideological line. Incidentally, this picture, these two young women are from a Baltic pride celebration in which the three 
the the gay communities of the three Baltic countries come together and they celebrate together um, a unified Baltic pride. That's just in, that just accidental that I that I, I picked that picture. Um, the so so where where we are then is a situation in which the NATO culture has changed. It's become more ideological and more assertively ideological. And this is how Adenauer and those guys would never have dreamed of bringing Ukraine in. They had no, there would have been no, no idea that a country uh, like Ukraine would ever join NATO under Adenauer. But under the likes of Tony Blair, there is that idea. Um, so it's a combination of how ideology has changed and how ideolog ideology has fused with strategy. Uh, this is some other. This is some screenshots I took of the NATO website. I'm nearly done. Diversity and inclusion at NATO. NATO highly values inclusion and perceives diversity as a strength. As such, NATO strives to ensure that its workforce reflects the distinctiveness and variation of its allies. NATO proactive strategies aim to attract, develop, and retain a mix of people with different skills, backgrounds, experiences, and cultures. This variety and access to a broader range of talent is essential to generate innovative ideas and insights and greatly contributes to NATO's efficiency. Here's another one. NATO headquarters hosts first ever conference on LGBTQ plus perspectives in the workplace. NATO headquarters hosts its first ever international conference on LGBTQ plus perspectives in the workplace on Friday, 19th of March, 2021. Organized by the staff led Proud at NATO volunteer group the online event brought together around 130 participants across civilian and military staffs, as well as national delegates to discuss the experiences and challenges of LGBTQ plus people at the workplace. Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg addressed the conference on the importance of inclusive leadership, saying every member of the LGBTQ plus community of NATO is a valued member of our staff and family because diversity and inclusion is the heart of who we are and what we do. Drawing on all resources and all experiences makes us stronger and better equipped to face the future. The Secretary General also expanded on the concept of allyship in the workplace, defining allies as people who do not identify as LGBTQ+, themselves, yet want to see a more inclusive world. He added, you will always have an ally in me. Stoltenberg, incidentally, is the first Secretary General who is a former prime minister he was the prime minister of norway as such um that first book i mentioned the second book i mentioned by sten ring he says actually this is a problem nato used to be led by defense secretaries and foreign secretaries it was not led by um prime ministers and presidents and that actually as prime ministers and presidents have gotten more involved in in this stuff actually nato's losing its way and they actually need to let the foreign secretaries and defense secretaries do the quiet business of NATO. Uh, that's just an aside. Um, but what you can see from this, and, and, and the other thing about this that neither of these two screenshots capture, is justification for NATO to... Um, NATO defines policy in relation to other countries based upon not classical liberal values, but modern 2024 progressive values. And I can tell you what I've been saying this to people for a while now. I don't know many people remember this, but Bush had a great, Bush Jr. had a great relationship with Putin. There's famously said he famously said, oh, I looked into the eyes of the man and I, I saw he had a good soul. And then Obama comes along. And it's under Obama that our relationship with Russia really plummets. And if you will rem those of you who are old enough might remember what really, I think, undermines the relationship with, with, um, with Russia is when Russia starts to crack down on that banned pussy riot, who did things like break into the Moscow Cathedral and pee on the altar. Uh, now, I don't have a problem with Russia cracking down on um, ultra-left-wing bans. Uh, but, of course, Obama made made a statement about it. And, oh, oh, oh. And it, it gives, it, it shows, it gives a basis for the line that, like, oh, there's a, you know, we need to support 
Ukraine because of so that Ukraine can have gay marriage. That really is sort of where we are in 2024 with NATO. Um, it is not just gay in and of itself. And I, I use that in the broader global American empire, just progressive on every issue. It's 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 actually letting escalation happen because. Russia doesn't want gay marriage, right? Like that is, that really is the case. And I think that this is also the broader story of liberalism. There's something, there's something inherently restless about liberalism that functionally liberalism was complete in, in 1914. But with the first and second world wars, liberalism faced these challenges and it was, and it couldn't just, it it wasn't content to go back to the way things were. It had to it had to keep moving, and in part it had to keep moving because it was replaced. It was no longer this pragmatic management system for the British and French empires. It was now going back to Quigley. We with the end of the First World War, we had the end of pragmatic empires. And we had the beginning of ideological blocks. And we had Germany leading the fascists, Russia leading the communists, and who led the, the, the West? It was America. And the ideology that they took was liberalism. And my contention about liberalism is that liberalism works when it's not an ideology, but sort of a pragmatic approach to the world. And I think that there's plenty of people to point to, like Adenauer, to say that liberalism as a pragmatic approach works, and it works very, very well. Liberalism as an ideology that is implemented top-down is a disaster, and I think that's what Blair represents. And, and, when, and, and the problem with liberalism, though, is it can never stop. It's always ideological liberalism always has to be looking for the next injustice to confront and so when it exists in 1992 with no peer competitor in the form of the soviet union anymore it has to then start looking at itself and at, at things that are not injustices right gays not being able to marry is not an injustice uh, Pussy Riot not being allowed to pee on altars and churches is not an injustice. Um, and and I think the story of NATO tells tells a story of, of liberalism. It, there was some sort of liberalism meaningfully did change after 1914, but liberalism meaningfully died uh, with the end of the Cold War. And and so that I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. That's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Well, I think another thing that shows in the pattern is this kind of maternal drive to protect everybody who's vulnerable. So when you pointed out that the, the when the Baltic nations joined, suddenly there were these people, there were these nations on the fringe, and there's this like kind of maternal. Um, drive to oh well they're vulnerable we have to protect them yeah and that's kind of what characterizes modern liberalism as well that it it, it, it can't see um this kind of it can't accept that the fact that there are margins that are vulnerable well even if it, it can create safety for all yeah 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 um you know it doesn't ideological liberalism doesn't respect spheres of influence. Um, the British and French prior to the First World War respected the concept of spheres of influence. Right, Russia and Britain um, come to a understanding about Iran and how Iran, different sectors of Iran, will fall into the uh, one empire's sphere of influence but neither of them will go in to Iran um, as an empire. Um, and that works. Um, now, whether or not that could have brought back after 1914, it's prob probably no. Um, 
there is this inevitable tide of history that I think we would have more or less gotten to where we are now, even if very significant things had happened differently. America in 1913 was always going to become what it is today. Um, Russia, I think, is not was never going to really be a competitor to the West. It's not industrialized enough. It's not densely populated enough. Um, it doesn't have the right set of um, individualistic sort of entrepreneurial um, attitudes. It's very innovative. A a brilliant, brilliant people. Um, I'm not. I hope nothing I've said today makes me think any less of the Russians. I have nothing but respect for the Russians. Um, So I, I I don't know. And Britain was always going to fall to America. The only, I mean, Britain has effectively. I hate to say, I do a lot of um, America bashing here. Britain, Britain dropped the ball in 1945. Britain had a real opportunity. to lead Europe, and it didn't. It, the empire was declining. It was reluctant to let the empire go. Um, it could really have led Europe. It could have led the EU into a much better direction. Um, ironically, I think actually the way Europe is going now is actually something that the British would want to be a part of because Macron... If, if Zion is right, Macron is taking Europe away from this, like, German economic redistribution program where Germany um, bribes other countries to, to for stability and for ideological purposes in order to keep its currency down and to export Benzes is now moving into this France-dominated vision of Europe in which the French are not interested in giving any of their money to anybody else. And so Macron is taking it more in this like political and identity um, um, sort of style of, of bloc, which I think the British would be much more interested in joining. Um, I be- Basically, I've subscribed to the dark EU uh, meme. And the dark EU as a thing that can stand on its own and in fact um, provide an alternative to America. But that's not um, pride flags, right? It is, it is, um, it's Christendom. I, you know, I, I I think that that's the, that's the way that I put it. I put it like that earlier. Um, And uh, yeah, that's what, yeah, I, I, I kind of have this image in my head, uh, you know, like the French, the snobby Frenchmen. You Americans, you know nothing about culture. You know. mm. They don't. It's true. Uh, <laughs> and and what's worse, what's worse in America not knowing anything about culture is that now uh, the British don't know anything about culture. Um, um, the English, yeah. the English identity is the most what's the way to put this the least poorly understood by its own people probably in the world the english have probably the poorest understanding of themselves uh they they might know the history they have no idea what it means to be english the english are the most deracinated country on the planet um um we the there's the French have fight very very hard for their for who they are and what they are. Um, the English, for a whole bunch of reasons, have had that drilled out of them, um, and I hate it. And we're the most we're the we're the globalist model. Um, you know, if you look at a map of England, and I, I mean, I don't mean to 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 boil this down simply to ethnicity, but if you look at a map of the British Isles. We had we had Leo Varadka, a Sri Lankan, as the Prime Minister of Ireland. We have um, uh, Hamza Youssef, a Pakistani, as the First Minister of Scotland. We have Rishi Sunak, an Indian, as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We have Sadiq Khan, 
a Pakistani as the mayor of London. And recently there's a new guy who I think is from Guyana, and he's the first minister of Wales. And then to top it all off, huh. the one indigenous person that we do have leading a government in the United in, in the British Isles is um, what's her face? Michelle Michelle something. And and she's leading the Northern Ireland Assembly, but she's Sinn Fein. And Sinn Fein is the political wing of the IRA. So the one indigenous person that we have in in leading a leading a government or or a, you know in, in in an executive position in the United Kingdom is a woman that hates Britain and is incredibly left you know is a socialist. Um, so it's it's. It's a crazy situation. We re- we really are like like uh, I, I don't blame people for laughing at us and what we become. Um, it's quite sad. <laughs> we had we had we had one percent of our population move into the country last year. We had we're a population of um, about sixty between sixty and seventy million. Um, it might be more than that. We might be around 75, apparently, but the government doesn't want to admit it. And we had 750,000 people come into the country net. Total immigrants were probably 1.2 million, between 1 and 1.2. When you factor out English people, British people that left, the net migration is 750,000. Um we, the city of Newcastle, um, how big is the city of Newcastle? Um, um, let me, let me, give me a second. The city of Newcastle is 300,000. Is it? Is it 300,000? And I, all I know is the statistic that we got. Newcastle's worth of Indians last year. We got an entire city um, worth of Indian people. And Jeff, I think I've established my position on Indians uh, in this. this. (laughs) That's episode five. Um, Is it? Is it episode five? (laughs) You you know, you know, you know the episode. yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy what they're doing to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that I noticed too, and I don't know if this gets us in trouble or not, but I've definitely well, I've definitely seen it firsthand. Is that they tend to move to the same city? I don't know if it's like yeah. that in England, but in, in uh, Canada, yeah. Well, because um, the support networks there. Um. Yeah. Exactly. So entire towns basically get, you know, the white population moves out and then the Indian population moves in. Yeah. Man. We, and now, now what we're getting, um, the messaging that we're getting is um, we need to make the countryside less white because the white flight has happened from the mm. cities and now these, like, mm. BLM-aligned groups are like, you need to get Muslims out into the English countryside. You need to get blacks out into the English countryside. Why? It's it's not even like it's not even like, oh, to enjoy it. It's it's to it's to take it away from whites is, is the, the messaging. Yeah. Um I, I don't care. I don't care if people want to come out and walk around the countryside. But if you're if the only reason that you're coming out there is so that you can rub it in my face that's why I don't like it. Stormzy, the rapper, uh, at one point started a publishing company. I don't know if it's still going. But the first book that he put out was written by a black girl who went to Oxford or Cambridge. I can't remember. And it's called Taking Up Space. And the premise of the book is, in part, huh. you need to go to Oxford and Cambridge just to deny that place, even if you don't really want to go to Oxford or Cambridge, you need to go just to deny that spot to an English kid. And then, I, I, I mean, I mean, 
I think the tide. I think the tide's turning. I think the high point is behind us. I think the high point was probably COVID, was lockdown. Um, I know guys like to be black pilled. I know the, the temptation of being black pilled, but I really do think, um, at least in England, things things are getting better, um, and uh, and we're we're hoping for uh, to pick up on an AA meme. Zero seats. We want zero seats for the Tories. They're running. There's an election in a few months. We want zero seats for the Tories. And I know what you're thinking. If you're not in Britain, wait a minute, Bucklander. Aren't the Tories the conservatives? That's right. Bucklander, why would you want zero seats for the conservatives? Because these people have been in power for 14 years. And they have lied about everything for 14 years. David Cameron gave us gay marriage. And he said, he recently posted um, uh, something a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it was like 10 years, 10 year anniversary or something of him getting gay marriage through. And he said, of all of the, my, my accomplishments as prime minister, the one that I'm most proud of is that we got through gay marriage. And he gives these stupid speeches that are like, you know, as a conservative, nothing embodies conservative values more than gay marriage. And it's just like, <laughs> Shut up! But but the worst part about it is, the Tories have control, and they're saying what you need to do is you need to vote for us again to address all these problems. The problem is that you've been in control of for fourteen years. Look, I know fourteen years of a government, you're gonna kind of run out of steam, and I and that's fine. But they let in seven hundred and fifty thousand people net into this country. They, they knew very well that the Brexit referendum was also a referendum on immigration. And what they did was, at the end of it, they said, okay, immigration is going to, immigration from Europe is going to slow down. How about now, now we can give out visas, unlimited visas. How about we just give them to Indians? And Boris Johnson flew off to India and he signed a free trade agreement deal with India. And if you sign a free trade deal agreement with India, the Indians always insist on you taking a certain number of Indians a year, giving Indians a year visas. Because they have too many fucking people than they know what to do with. Right? People are out here worried about Russia or China. I'm not. I'm worried about India. I'm worried about 1.4 billion Indians... And what declining populations in Europe and China are going to do in terms of giving India more power in the ba- in, in in the balance of power? I'm that's what I'm worried about. I, I think India, it, as a single country, is the one that I worry the most about. But of course, the place in the world I worry the most about is probably Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, both for both positively and negatively, uh, if nothing changes, they're going to have there's going to be 800 million Nigerians by the end of the century if nothing changes. There's currently 300 million. 800 million Nigerians are not going to sit in Nigeria. They're going to look north. Now the other problem, though, is I worry about Sub-Saharan Africa for other reasons as well, which is if Peter Zion is right. And these supply chains are breaking down, one of which, the most important of which, might be the fertilizer supply chain. If you think global food production is going to take a serious hit in the next 25 to 50 years, the first place it's going to feel it is Africa. And I think we could have 90% of Africa potentially die in my lifetime. So I'm worried about Africa in both ways. Um, it's not a sustainable, uh, it's not self-sustaining, but anyway, I'm, 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 I'm ranting. I don't hate anybody. Uh, I don't Renegade hate has a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Renegade has a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Well, uh, one is about how to get, how to get NATO back to being pragmatic, a pragmatic liberal organization. Uh, <sighs> Does it have to have a competing organization, or can it just turn itself around in that sense? Putting the defense ministers back in charge instead of the prime ministers. Uh, one of the things that NATO is... Um, I, I forgot to mention it. That NATO is worried about 
is is um, climate change. I actually hope that uh, Greta Thunberg is right about climate change because what I hope, what I believe the problem liberalism has is climate change pushes global history. It's probably the single largest driver of global history. I don't mean that in terms of climate change is responsible for Brutus stabbing Julius Caesar. That's not what I mean. What I mean is on on a macro scale, climate change is responsible for um, the Mesopotamian and Egyptian river valleys being able to support um, the, the, the first versions of, of civilization. So I mean climate change pushes history in that sense. What my hope is, is weirdly, is that climate change is bad, but that it drives us to create a new set of solutions and forces us to be to stop being so inward looking. I want external threats and challenges that force us to look outside and to cease looking internally. I use I use the term pejoratively, Jeff. I apologize. Navel gazing. Um, navel gazing is something that uh, a certain branch of Orthodox monks engage in. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, but. But I, I don't, I don't, I want us to look outwards. Now, I don't think that, that means having Warsaw Pact 2.0. Um, I think that there's better, there's better alternatives. But it means us looking at ways of solving real problems. We are currently trying to solve things that are not real problems. Um... The whole BLM agenda, the whole LGBT agenda, you know, it's a little bit like the Norm McDonald joke, right? Norm Norm had this joke where he goes, ah, ah you hear they got a cure for AIDS. Uh, really? What, what are you talking about? Yeah, stop having gay sex and using other people's needles. That's the cure for AIDS, right? The cure for our problems that we're dealing with in 2024 is to stop even thinking about them. You can stop thinking about BLM. You can stop thinking about um, statues of guys that owned slaves but also gave an endowment to Harvard University. You can just stop thinking about that. It's not real. Blacks in America have it better than you know 99% of, the, of people that have lived throughout history. Um, any, any intelligent black guy that's hardworking, any, any, he could get a job anywhere, anywhere that he wanted. People would trip over themselves to, to give a meritocratic black guy a job. It's not a problem. Similarly, not a problem is, um, girls that are tomboys and going through puberty, feeling awkward they're not they're not actually boys right it's not a problem they're just awkward they're go it's called puberty everybody goes through it. everybody feels off and weird it's you figuring out this this you know you've been you've been riding a bicycle and someone throws you the keys to a ferrari and says get in kid and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out how to work this thing it doesn't mean that you know it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be in it. You are that thing. So you just you, we can just stop worrying about LGBT stuff. They're not discriminated against. Um, there's no problem there other than us thinking there's a problem there. We It's our own thinking that is creating the reality of these problems. There might be some sort of problem with climate change. I have found a new website that I, I, is really interesting to me. In which you can track um, the UK's um, the UK's power grid and how much of the power going into it is um, renewable or fossil fuel or nuclear, and it's really really interesting to me. I find it really um, interesting. And 
the largest single contributor to the UK's power grid now is wind. I'm looking at it right now. At current, as of midnight, 57.2% of the UK's power was generated by wind. And that was the largest one. Over the last week combined, wind made up across the seven days, it made up 47.6% of um, all power generation. Now there's, there's, there's conditionals there, right? The effective type of wind is in Britain is offshore wind. I see no reason whatsoever why we shouldn't try and maximize that. I, offshore wind, fine, great, let's do it, let's do it. Because I don't want to give my money to the worst people on the planet in Saudi Arabia and UAE. I don't want to give my money to them. I'm very happy to embrace renewables if they work. I see no reason. I'm very happy to embrace um, uh, fission. Is it f- or fusion? Cold fusion. Um, let's let's do it. What what a wonderful challenge I think um, climate change offers us. Whether or not climate change is real, right? I'm not I'm not conceding that I think climate change is real. I'm just saying, or I think climate change is real. Anthropogenic, uh, anthropomorphic, anthropogenic climate change. Um, climate change is driven by humans. Uh, I don't know if that's real. But I don't see a reason why we shouldn't, you know, you, you would rather have a solar panel next to your house than a coal smokestack. There's no, there's no argument there. Um, the quality of the air that you breathe is related to that. So why not? Let's run with it. And so, and I, you know, Elon, be very careful with Elon. He could either be like our guy or he's the Antichrist, right? Um, well, until he reveals himself as one or the other, I'm going to treat him as something in between. But what what an amazing challenge it is to like, let's harness some asteroids, Let's 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 get some let's get some lithium off of an asteroid instead of mining it from the Congo, uh, and then having all these accusations about imperialism because they're gonna cry really hard when we don't even have to go into the Congo and the benefits of the Congo of us mining lithium disappear. P- you know, it's one of these things about people like see these pictures of Africans doing horrible things in mines and they go oh my god this is terrible and they forget about or they see bangladeshis in sweatshops sewing clothes look i don't like them i don't like i I don't like what they're going through not i don't like them i don't like what they're going through but it is some (laughs) sort of necessary step on the system of progress because our ancestors worked in cotton mills in Britain and in the coal mines of Britain. They went through the same things. And these people are often desperate for the sweatshop job because it's still better than working in the rice paddy. Now the leftist is going to say, yeah, but we should just give them, you know, $30,000 a year. Well, I don't... uh, No, I I don't think that's going to work. I think they have to earn it. I think they have to... You know, it, if you um, easy come, easy go, right? If you work for something, though, you value it. And I think, I think if there's any hope for Africa uh, or any other part of the world that is not currently at Western economic standards, it has to earn it for itself. So this is my long, my long response to your thing. There has to be external challenges for the West, but not just West for humanity to grab a hold of. And those Western, those external challenges do not have to be existential. Um, but unfortunately, existential challenges seem to help. They seem to focus the mind. Uh, I think another thing that you hit on there is also um, kind of technological paradigm shifts. Because... The possibility of, for, for example, cold fusion, right? That is something that, once that that becomes a real possibility, then 
human, then a lot of brilliant minds will begin shifting their attention towards things like that as well. But yeah, but look, and, and every day we're getting closer and closer to it, it seems like, what I, I keep seeing things about it. But once, nu- once cold fusion is declared to be economically viable, it's going to take decades to roll it out as a technology. And it will take... And the moment someone starts building the, 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 the system for it, it's going to take a decade to get the first um, like uh, power grid cold fusion plant online. It's Cold fusion in the next 100 years is not going to do anything for Zimbabwe. If you're holding out hope of cold fusion for the fucking I don't know Tajiks, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um it's 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 got to trickle down and um I'm not I'm not I don't think I don't think the real problems for humanities uh lie in energy. Um other than the where it does lie as a problem for energy is governments over regulating and taxing energy. Um, if you we we are we are killing ourselves with net zero, and I believe in the next ten years net zero will disappear as a policy globally. Um, we are killing ourselves for net zero. And it's like a guy who's frustrated that he can't run faster when he's carrying a thousand pounds of dead weight on his back. You could literally just put it down, bro. You could just literally run if you wanted to. But we're not. We're, we're, we're killing ourselves with net zero. Um, and I say that as someone who just, who just not five minutes ago, uh, made a case for clean renewable energy as um as somewhere that we could look i i i you know why not why not have how about we just how about we just use everything that will work for us um and let's let's have a look at renewables and see if they're going to work for us um how about gas how about how about a little bit of coal here and there if we need it let's just let's just fuck let's just do it Let's just do it, please. And the and and so in some ways, Renegade, you are right. Like we we just don't have a big enough problem for us to focus on. So we're inventing problems for us for ourselves. We we could be Star Trek, right? And that now. goes back to that. Um, that goes back to that pragmatic liberal versus ideological liberal thing too. Yeah, it's that uh, the ideolog the ideologue wants net zero because it's I- it's ideologically driven, right? To have it looks good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but where the pra- the pragmatic will say we'll we'll take what we'll use whatever technology we have right now. Yeah. And work towards. But you you know what's coming after yeah. net zero? If they ever got net zero, it'd be net negative. It would be we have to start unwinding the amount of carbon that's been put into the atmosphere over the last two hundred and fifty years. I mean it, that, that's it because the prag and and that but I I mean that as as a uh, an extension of your point because it's the restlessness of ideologic of ideology not ideological liberalism it's the restlessness of, yeah. of ideology it will once the goal is met it will not be oh we can take a break it will be like we've got to keep going because ideologies are kind of revolutionary you have to constantly keep yeah. the 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 mob behind you going because if you if you don't give them a reason to continue to being a mob your power will either either your power will disappear or somebody else will give them a reason to be, keep being a mob and the first thing they're going to do yeah. is is yeah. attack you because they're going to be like ah see yeah. this person is now a counter revolutionary and we have to do and and exactly, yeah. so you you're they're riding the tiger they're riding the tiger and it's why the british guys you look at of the british empire are they're so appealing and they're so rational compared to like 
the girl bosses. Uh, it, 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 um, yeah. I think I think I think uh, we're running out of steam though, as a, as a program. We're yeah. n- not this not not this stream, um, <laughs> but but the, the 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 this sort of ideological liberals, um, and and ironically the ideological liberals have created enough pr- problems for the pragmatic liberals to come back and start worrying about. So. Uh, you think we're, we've gone over the peak? I think you need to take a little bit long. I think we'll get past it fine. I just don't think it's been peak yet. Are you talking to me there, Renegade, or somebody else? I don't yeah. think we've gone over the peak. Well, you think... you. Th- okay. I think well, that, that was something that you said about 10 minutes ago. Oh, uh, I think we can fight. I think something we can get it. Lines, yeah. Oh, the, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I see. I thought you meant the peak of the West. No, the peak of ideology. I don't know about Canada, but I think in um, in in Britain, the peak is behind us. We're going to have a the Labour Party come in with a huge majority, and a lot of people are a lot of people might think that's bad. I think it's going to be good. I think that the Labour Party is going. My hope is that the Labour Party is so big that they have to basically create an opposition for themselves. And therefore, the Labour Party will be opposing... One faction of the Labour Party will be opposing itself. Um, And what I think that means is that people will see that five years of the Labour Party is just the same. It's, 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 it's It's not Tories or Labour, it's globalists. And the Labour globalists are just as bad as the Tory globalists. So my hope is not that um, anything happens in the next five years. My hope is that five years from now, not the next election, but the election after it, people vote for something, a real change. And I think it's I think it's realistic. Um, I don't want to go down the road of internal British politics, but for a number of reasons, I think the British have had, are just the English are just sick of it. We where uh, where if you look, there's an amusing image, which is um, like people who document anti-trans um, tweets on social or I, maybe on social media itself, and like the rest of the world is like, oh, uh, there's there's bright spots here and there where where. There's a lot of anti-trans tweets. And then there's Britain. And Britain is, like, brighter than the rest of the world combined. And we're called... They, it's called Turf Island. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, <laughs> turf being, for those who don't know, trans-exclusive... Trans-exclusive radical feminists. They're feminists who radical think... Fem- yeah. Yeah, they're feminists who think um um uh, This is this is it. Um I'm going to So yeah, you can see like uh, in some ways the the English are just not having it. Um, no, that's not what I wanted. Ah. So yeah, you can see you can see what uh, what Burton is capable of when it when it wakes up. Um, We're the we're the most controlled by globalists of any country, but I think we're also uh, that's that's for a reason because I think the globalist hates the Anglo more than anyone else. We we we're we're such a group of angry individualists that just want to be left alone that that spirit of England uh, is is exa- is. The antithesis to globalism. 
Um, so they've come for us first. <laughs> that's my that's 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 my cope. And the Canadians. Well, this is a great image of hope. A great, <laughs> a great <laughs> image to leave up as we as we kind of play ourselves out. <laughs> Yeah, Turf Island, guys. Um, all right, let me get some. Uh, I don't have anything as good uh, at generated. Um, um, I, I'm gonna go with the one I like. I, I just again, don't read anything into this. It's just uh, the one that I like. So like, uh. all right. Thanks, guys. Oh, and next time, um, probably going to be the very, very last chapter of Quigley dealing with um the uh the rise of western civilization and pick it up take it from um the rise of the west to uh right before tragedy and hope so it sort of fills in the blank on on where tragedy and hope picks up so that's that's for next time thanks for coming and uh thanks for watching and see you guys next time